So we're on page 94, and we're in the Halakha Bura Siman Nun Aleph. Says Rabbi David Yosef, someone who enters a shower room. What is a shower room? Like a bathroom of the toilet. Right, it could be that it doesn't have. Like you say. It doesn't have a bathroom in it. Or it's either a bathtub or a shower. Meaning it could be a shower room or a bathtub room. Doesn't make a difference. But it's a place where people go to, to bathe themselves. In order to bathe there, he has to wash his hands after he finishes taking a bath. Hmm. Do you know that, Halakha? After you come out of the bath, the shower? No. You have to do it to that. I mean, it's the cleanest time of your life. But that's how it's done. And the person should wash his hands once. Then he does not have to wash his hands three times. And without bracha. For all of these are without bracha, right? Especially when, specifically when you wash your body, that's when you have to wash your hands. But if you enter the shower room, you just walked in there. Remember we said last week, if you just walk into the bathroom, you, you don't have to go to the bathroom. You went to get something that you still have to wash your hands. Yes. So here we're talking about the shower room. You're going into the shower room. In order not to wash your body, you just have to step in there to get something. And you don't have to wash your hands. Well, that's good now because we have the toilet with a separate door. Oh, so that, that's what would make the difference here. So I can wash in there. So, you don't have to wash your hands after. One wants to be strict and wash his hands, so he can receive an extra blessing. If you enter the shower room, what's he saying here special? You tell me what he's saying different than what he just said. If you enter the bath, I'm not the bath, I mean, I'm not, a, not where you, the toilet is, but bath where the bath is. You enter the room with the bath, not the room with the shower, the room with the bath, in order, and you're not going there to wash your body. There's no toilet in there. You don't have to wash your hands at all when you come out. What's the difference between what he just said and the one with the shower? So he said with the shower, or when he said first, he, he, if he does say, does wash his hands, he receives a blessing, an well, extra blessing. No, probably first time he meant that there is a kisser, the toilet. No, okay. And now he specifies that there is not. Well, it's about nudity? Like, it was like you know, no, no, what's the difference between curtain? a shower room and a room with a bath? A shower usually has like a curtain and it's closed. Oh, it's probably public. Like, yeah, I think it's. I think the bath usually, like, it was expensive to kind of do all the to to put the water together. So, bath probably had like six or seven people. Maybe the shower was just private. Do you think when he says bath and rechatz, he's referring to like a communal shower? Communal room? bath, yeah, yeah, communal. There is that. That is the word you would use for a communal shower. It's also the word you would use for a private shower. Mm. Okay, I, I'm willing to say that it could be the, the public shower room. I mean, you're not the one taking the shower there, but it's a public shower room. That would be different than the Ambatia. Okay. You could wash your hands in a room with a bath that doesn't have a toilet. Whether for a meal or for in the morning. But you should just make the blessing outside. You can't make the blessing in that room, but you're allowed to wash your hands in that room. I mean, the room is not tameh enough to, to not allow you to make a blessing, uh, to not allow you to wash your hands in it. Oh, oops. <clears throat> you want for bread. Yes. That's what he said. For bread and for the money. Hanotel tziponav, one who cuts his nails. Literally... Notel means to remove his nails, or to take his nails. Or... Notel can mean a few things. Notel, al-netilat means to wash your hands. Al-netilat love means to take the lulav. 
Alutilatziponaim could be to take the nails, meaning to remove the nails. It's a word with a, with a few meanings. Not like he who wanted to say that when you say Alutilatziponaim, it's on the taking of the hands. It doesn't mean anything, taking of the hands. You can't take your hands. Well, your hands are part of you. What are you taking? <laughs> Hanotel Tziponav, one who removes his nails, Tzarich Titor Yadav Lacham again, he must wash his hands afterwards. That's the Gemara, and the Shukhan Aruch says that. Vafinu Natal Miktzat Tziponav, and even if you take even just a little bit of your nails, Tzarich Titor Yadav Lacham again, he must wash his hands afterwards. Vachel Afinu Natal Tziponav, and the other even if someone else cuts his nails, Tzarich Titor Yadav, he has to wash his hands. But the one who cut the nails, let's say a person has his uh, attendant cutting his nails for him. So the attendant doesn't have to cut his nails. Really? Uh, doesn't have to wash his nails. Even if he touches the nails. Even if he touches the actual nails. Even if he touches the actual nails. What about like a nail clipper? Does that have two on it? Like if you touch the clipper, <clears throat> you're not using the cut nails. It's well, you're seeing, let's, what do you see here? You see here now that even he who touches the nails right. doesn't have to, have to do it. So remember, makes, definitely by the, the nail clipper. Because I always thought it was like they gave you too much to touch. It's definitely not clean. Or, I don't know. It's, it's not clean. What, no. what do we see? Where do we find <laughs> Maran right? Maran says, you see on page 91 on the top? Maran says, Hanotel <laughs> Tziponav, he who cuts his nails. 91, he's saying all the things up here. It's the last bold line. All the things that a person has to do to that that for. So the last one he says, Hanotel Tziponav, he who cuts his nails. So let's see here. <clears throat> the Rabbi Yafel Alev, he writes that you can learn out from the language of Maran, Hanotel Tziponav, he who cuts his own nails. Not he who cuts nails for somebody else. Which is interesting, Chidush. There seems to be something about removing the removal of the nails that causes too much, not the actual nails. That's what it seems to be. He says the same thing, by the way. He says the same thing regarding cutting hair. The one who cuts the hair doesn't have to do that to them, but the one who got the hair cut has to do that to them. Every time you get a trim, you have to... Yeah, in your beard, even if you just cut, cut a hair. But here we have the Kavachayim. And I, for some reason, my heart tells me the Kavachayim is right over here. But it's not right to say something. But my heart tells me that the Kavachayim says the one who cut the nails and the one who's got the nails cut, both of them have to do that today. Hanotel Tziponav, the Shukhanuch is speaking in the way things are right. You cut your own nails. How many people have somebody to cut his own nails for? <laughs> Let's see what uh, Kafka answer, but I'm almost positive. Hey, what about women's pedicure now? Pedicure, you know. Mm -hmm. So they go to front places. I oh, they, uh, Ladies do this all the time. Women have to do all the same washing we do on this, this kind of washing, right? We're talking about all yeah. these. Uh, I'm wondering in, if, you know, like you went to like a religious salon, if the women who did the nails had to wash yeah, after every time. person. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It would be interesting. Maybe if they wear gloves. You should know that, <laughs> that you have to say a bracha, Shalom Samisha. <laughs> Shalom yeah. Sani Shalom. You say in the morning, mm -hmm. a man has a certain. Sort of, I'm not. It's not. A, I'm not telling you here <coughs> something sexist. Or, a man has freedom to leave the house. You know, look in the mirror for a second. You got. You walk out the door and you're good. A lady before she's a, she's an event to the way people look at her, the way people think about her. They, they have to go somewhere to get your nails done and your hair done and your face done. But it's enough. Imagine if you had to spend that much time just on your physical appearance. You have to say it. it's, it's a certain level of freedom that you have. According to Halakha, technically a man is not allowed to look in the mirror. Do you know that? The mirror is considered uh, the, the, the way of a woman. And therefore, men didn't look into the mirror traditionally. Mm -hmm. The famous the famous yeah, question. It's supposed to be bitter, luscious. <coughs> because it's considered like wearing a skirt. That's what it's considered now. Mm -hmm. You want I'll, uh, I'll administer the <laughs> <laughs> But you should know Next that. Time you shave. <laughs> the truth <laughs> the, the truth is the truth is that the first <clears throat> rabbi who wanted to suggest that people should look into a mirror to straighten their tefillin, mm. there's a very, very angry response to him. He said, How are you allowing people to violate one halakha in order to perfect another halakha? Especially do you know when your tefillin are in the middle of your head, where do they have to be? 
Yeah. 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 You have to be on on your hairline wherever yeah. you what started today's hairline back there. So where it started, right? We don't move the feeling back with the hair. And so it has to be parallel to that and in between the eyes, not here, up here. But if you would go like this, centered. Be yeah. centered. Yeah. How exact does it have to be? Well, how much? Yeah, what's mm-hmm. the precision that needed? You see, people use mirrors. Even my feeling comes with the mirror. But the mirror is like this. Do you know why I use a mirror? The whole face. Because because other perfect. people come to me and check my feeling. <laughs> when my feeling are a little bit off, I always have that one person who comes and moves my uh, feeling over. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I'd rather just spare myself the embarrassment and look. Normally, I try not to use the mirror. I go to the Avon Kodesh. It has a, I don't know if it's better to use the Avon Kodesh, but it has glass over there. Anyways, I'm standing there, so I look at it. But I'll tell you that the Halakha says that so long as you feel, feel, it feels like it's in the middle, that's in the middle. Uh, Hashem doesn't expect you to measure now out. I someone sent me an application for your phone. You look into it and it has rulers. On, it's a, it's oh. a camera and it has rulers. <laughs> There's an app for everything. It comes with a cedar. Oh, yes, exactly, this one. So, I mean, it's nice whoever made the app. I hope he doesn't charge anybody money for it. But, but this is a, it's a silly invention. That's not how it happens. So today, but what we say is that today men also look in mirrors. It's not a prohibition of looking into mirrors anymore. But you had Chachamim, Chachamim Yisrael, that never looked into mirrors. So I once heard a story about Rav Shach. I think it was about Rav Shach. Don't, don't hold me to it. He once looked at himself. He said they once showed him a picture of himself in the newspaper. Yeah, they, oh, Rabbi, they printed an article in the newspaper. Look, and they pointed his picture. Said, "Wow, who is that? That looks like Rabbi uh, Rabbi Ruben <laughs> Rizovsky." <laughs> and he looked at him. <laughs> said, "Rabbi, it's you." And I said, "That's what I look like." Well, <laughs> he was he just didn't ever look at himself. It was one of those things that, that was new to him. <laughs> but it, so today everyone looks in the mirror. That, yeah, but also, I would say that it, someone with thirty minutes looking into the mirror, okay, example, you know, look, go, oh, keep moving. The <laughs> fact that you don't have someone to come do your nails, you should make a bracha every time you see your mirror. <laughs> it says here, I, I'll tell you, what can I tell you? I'm with the kavachaim. I don't agree with Rabbi David Sotz Kapuli. The kavachaim says he who cuts the nails and he who got the nails cut, he who cuts the hair and he who got the hair cut. Both of them should do Tilat Nidam. Now I can tell you, tell you why Rabbi David Yosef is being lenient. I mean, this whole thing is it a biblical mitzvah? No, what is no. it? It's a rabbinic mitzvah. Is so rabbinic mitzvah. So what is this? It's a fake. You're in doubt. There's two opinions. Take the lenient opinion. I agree with him on the rule. I don't agree with him on the interpretation of Shulchan Aruch. The fact that the Shulchan Aruch used the word "he who cuts his own nails," it didn't mean to tell you, Malan, he who cuts his own nails. That's just the language he would use. And so he's he's making an analyzation, not his, the Yafin Aliv, the big rabbi, but I agree with the Kafakhaim here. So you can put in your notes here that I believe that the person who's cutting the nails also, not me, the Kafakhaim believes, he should also do Tilati then. Vanotel Tsiponav, and he who cuts his nails. Dai bekach, it's enough. Dai, like dayenu. She told Yadav pamachat that he should wash his hands once. Vim hayu tzipornav odefot al habasar. What do you mean once? Once on each. Once on each side. Yeah, very good. Vim hayu tzipornav odefot al habasar. And if his nails protruded past his flesh, the long nails. The person has longer nails. Al piyasod, according to Kabbalah. That person has to wash his hands three times alternatively. That level of fingernails where the nails are long, according to Kabbalah, is considered very bad for you. Uh, a person should cut his nails. Nails in Kabbalah are considered all kinds of things that I'm not familiar <laughs> with. But, so far, the, the Benish Chai would tell you that on Erev Tisha B'Av, you should cut your nails if your nails are too long, according to Kabbalah. That's a, a mashash that disagrees with him. So how far is it considered to be the nails longer than the flesh? Like, can you just see whites? I mean, yours obviously are not. I know, my nails are cut. But it, it's but a, if you go by the side like this, you're like... It, <coughs> that would, that would be the pshat over here. Is that if the, it's protruding past where your finger is. Or past your finger. So that's, that's where it should cut. That's yeah, pretty, pretty long. long. But it's, yeah. 
I listened that the Rebbe, the Baruch Rebbe, had a long time. <coughs> <Who>? <coughs> Chabad is very famous about this. The Rebbe, uh, to my knowledge, didn't explain himself. But from the perspective of Kabbalah, we don't understand what the Rebbe did. <coughs> it doesn't make sense, but that was be, that was his calculation. But I'll tell you, I'm going to go out on a limb here, and I'm on the camera. I, what I'm saying now is, is 100% speculation. Do you know who the Rebbe's Rebbe was? The Alter Rebbe? No. No. <laughs> his father was. For a little bit of his life. I mean, when he became... Who, who did he get smicha from, you know? Ooh, not from his father? Oh. Most Kabbalists don't even know. Let's see. You can tell us. <laughs> <laughs> no. His name was Rabbi Yosef Rosen. He was called the Ruggachover. The Ruggachover Rugga Gaon. A famous mm -hmm. rabbi. He wrote a book called the Tzafnat Panech. If you look in the Rebbe's writings, a lot of time he quotes him. <coughs> the Tzafnat Panech. The Rebbe mm -hmm. has a letter somewhere where he said that he learned his way of learning he got from the Ruggachover. Mm -hmm. The Ruggachover is a book that almost every yeshiva in the world studies the Ruggachover. The more Lithuanian you get, the more they study the Ruggachover. It's interesting. He was Hasidic. What they don't tell you is he was Lubavitch. But he was the rabbi of the of the Lubavitch Rebbe. The Ragachavar was one of, they called him the Ragachavar Gaon, the Gaon, because nobody understood him. He was brilliant, brilliant to a point where the things he writes, it takes a very long time to understand what he's trying to say. Brilliant, brilliant. And when you read a piece of his and you finally get it, oh, it's like, it's like Gareda. <coughs> so, the Ragachavar <coughs> is famous. Maybe you forget, oh, I can't do it. Can someone look him up on your phone? I, you need to see a picture of him. Ragachavar, R O. You take a risk. <laughs> R O G O V A T C H E R, something like that. Do a fast. Google will come up with something. That's R U G A V A T C H E R. Whatever rugged chubber sounds like. Yeah. <laughs> There's something about his hair here. So look at the picture. Oh, yeah, he's got quite a good head of hair. Oh, there you go. Oh, gosh, that's great. You know, giant mustaches and stuff. Looks like Bob Marley. Let's see. <laughs> this is one of the brilliant Don't rabbis who ever lived. <laughs> this is the Rugged Chopper. Whoa. Mm -hmm. The Rugged Chopper never went to get a haircut. Wow. He said uh, he didn't have time in his day to waste time to get a haircut. <laughs> he was too busy learning to learn. So he just grew his hair endlessly. Mm -hmm. He said he didn't go get haircuts. Never once in his life? I, I, maybe when he was younger. But when he became a tzaddik, I, not from there. Mm. It could be the Lubavitch Rebbe also. The Lubavitch Rebbe was a person. <laughs> That's <laughs> what you're saying. The Lubavitch Rebbe was <laughs> around, <laughs> around the clock, learning Torah, teaching Torah, pushing Torah. Could be that he also, <clears throat> I don't know, it's speculation. Could be that he got that character trait of, listen, of course I'm supposed to cut my hair. Of course I'm supposed to get a haircut. I don't have time to what spend 30 is? seconds to do this. This also shows up on the yeah, so like rule here, cutting the beard too. <laughs> Which is <laughs> this also uh, comes yeah, up with a search. That was a younger picture. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, I got the <laughs> time. <laughs> <laughs> no, but this, if you keep going, there's one for oh, was, his uh, halachic ruling on cutting the beard, not cutting the beard ever. Hmm. And there's a picture of the Rebbe under the Rebbe tree here. So <laughs> what years are we talking about? It's the uh, 50s? No, the early 1900s. <clears throat> I don't know how I don't think the Rebbe Chavar lived past, not that late you could, if you already have a picture of him you can look up to when he lived yeah. it's funny because I didn't spell it correctly and I could, it says do you mean rug washer <laughs> <laughs> a big tzaddik if you ever have a chance to learn something from him his learning is brilliant you have some of his firm not directly quotes from his Svarim. There are people that his Svarim it's like concentrate. It's like the commentary of the Vilna Gaon and the Shulchan Aruch. Everyone's like, oh, the Vilna Gaon said. You go look it up. The Vilna Gaon doesn't say anything. The Vilna Gaon gives you a list of sources. He doesn't write, and he expects you to go through the sources and come to the same conclusion he came to. This is a person was so beyond genius that that's how we thought. So it's better for me when other people do the work. They explain what he meant, and then we learn them. So it says here, Vanotel Tsiponav. Now we did this one? Okay. Uh, 95. Vanotel Tsiponav Bishenav. The top of 95. Somebody who bites his nails, chews his nails. 
You're removing them with his teeth. Oh, yeah, what's I've seen a lot of people do that. So there's a halacha for That's bad news. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a lot of fun. Sarich litol yadav, l'achar mekein, he must do for that to die afterwards. Vechen an hotel tzipone raglav. Vechen an hotel tzipone raglav, and he removes his toenails. Tzarich not with his teeth. Biting? Tzarich litol yadav, l'achar mekein, he must wash his hands afterwards. Even if his hands were clean, uh, his feet were clean, he still has to do it to that name afterwards. <laughs> and if his hand, if his feet weren't clean, even if he just touches them, he has to do it to that name. Mm-hmm. Right. So the chidush here is because they're clean. If he touches them, he wouldn't have to do it to that name. But here, even if they're clean, because he's cutting his nails. He has to do that today. So when you touch your feet, you don't have to... If they're clean. They're clean, okay. <laughs> That's subjective. Yeah. <laughs> Let's ask you this question. So you're in the middle of cutting your nails. You didn't do that today yet. And now you hear Kaddish. Why? Imagine you live in Yerushalayim, in the street across the house, the windows open, you're hearing Kaddish, the, 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 the more, uh, I don't know. Or you're in a house of mourning. Right, okay, so hopefully a house of a bar mitzvah and you they do a minion in the house and purpose and they're they're having a simcha and you hear them say Kaddish or Kedusha, so what do you do? Your hands now need to let it down. So Bashomea Kaddish of Dusha, someone who listen hears Kaddish of Dusha, in the middle Shnoten Tip only a dime while he's cutting his fingernails, you have sick, you should stop, via name at Sibu and you should answer with the Sibu. Without washing. Yeah. That tells you about the, something about the level of. Uh, you wash your hands. Tame from cutting the nails. It's not enough to stop you from saying you don't wash your hands. Right. <coughs> so, you should, so you should stop and say a minute. Yes, but Zev just he's trying to find the limits of where this goes. So that's a good different. I mean that this. This cutting of nails is not enough to stop you from saying Kaddish Kedusha. V'chen ha'shomei ha'kol ra'amim. What do you want to say? So can we do generalization and say like, if uh, this Nitalat Yadayim doesn't require a bracha, then we can say Amen to... Uh, I didn't see that yet. It could be, <laughs> but once we go through all the cases, most Nitalat Yadayim don't need a bracha. So that wouldn't be accurate, like after the bathroom or something like that. You don't make a bracha, but still, you would not be able to say if your hands are dirty, things like that. What if you hear thunder? Or you see lightning? In the middle of cutting your nails. So you don't have to make a bracha when you hear thunder, or you right, see lightning. Right. Yeah? Mm-hmm. Sure. Now here in San Diego, you barely ever have this right. opportunity. First time I went to the East Coast, I saw lightning. Wow, it's not a movie, it's real. <laughs> it's in the sky, amazing. Yafsik, you should stop. Vivarech ala ramim ala barkim, and you should make a blessing on the thunder and lightning. The same thing on the status of the Tuma. Yosef, can I ask you to give me a book from the back shelf, please? Yeah. <laughs> It's the second bookcase from the right. Okay. And I need it. I'm going to tell you one second what I need. The Tzit Eliezer. There's, you see next to those blue books on the second shelf? Yeah. To the right of them is a whole set of brown books. I need number Zion, I should say. It could be like Alad Bet Gimel's in one volume and then Dalad Hay. Which is, which Zion is it? Yeah, there's an old Zion in there. Maybe we could bring both of them, okay. just in case. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, 
when they did this one. Okay. No, you're right, because what they did is he wrote like 27 books or whatever it is, and they put them in, in oh, eight they, volumes. They so yeah. you have a few books in each volume. So this one is Zion, but it's really number 14 until, you know, it's, it's a different okay. Zion. So we're looking for Simon Bet. Yes, thank you. See, the source for this halakha, that in the middle of cutting your nails, and you hear Kaddish, or Dusha, or the blessing, is from a rabbi, you'll see his source. <coughs> you see the Kuf Lamed Chet, the bold Kuf Lamed Chet, in the Rashi script. Mm -hmm. The Kuf Lamed Chet says, Ken Katav, that's what it says, Bishut Maharsham in the questions and answers of the Maharsham. Mm -hmm. Then he says, katav and look at who argues with me with him. Bishut Tzit Eliezer in this book Tzit Eliezer. This is Rabbi Eliezer Waldenberg. So what I'm looking here is I want to see what is his argument. It could be that we're going to find ourselves in a situation where we also don't agree. Did you look. just remember? Did you remember? No, no, no. I, I saw that. Okay. That's pretty. Um, I bet you had the book. <laughs> Hashem said I saved up to buy this. I've been from since I was 19. I wanted to buy this thing, so finally this year we're able to get it. Um, so okay, so he's quoting here. This is what the Marasham says. Marasham writes, "Uvem, this is the exact language. Uvem, tani tilat tzivonaim. If in the middle of cutting your nails, mutar laanot amen. You're allowed to answer amen. V'shamati, and he hears. I heard from the Av Bedin of Zlatov." <laughs> He says, "Shara'a beinav mi ba'al heshiv Moshe from the Rabbi Yeshiv Moshe, Shaya no seven no ten b'divrei Torah that he would be speaking words of Torah with people, be'odon no ten tzivonav while he was cutting his nails. V'af she'arak shomeh mipim shetziva lomar rashita lefanav b'shad dat tzivonai haya shomeh keonet." Okay, so what you see from here is you're allowed to say Amen and you're allowed to learn Torah. Why are you cutting your nails in the public place? In the middle of the street. I'm not learning to run on the same way you're cutting nails. Yeah, I guess. It's kind of weird. Why can't you get nails in the house? I mean, too. What's amazing about it today is I have to tell you. Is he was an Ashkenazi rabbi. No, no, he passed away in... It was in Yeshiva when he passed away. I mean, it wasn't so long ago. He was the chief rabbi of the Shari Tzedek Hospital. Many of his tshuvot that are special, that we call him out on, are tshuvot where he deals with medical issues. Because he was familiar with them. Uh, he has here an incredible thing that you don't find. You find by, let's say, Rabbi Badi Yosef. That he quoted in Ashkenazim, Sephardim, early rabbis, late rabbis, Hasidic rabbis. You don't find that so much by the Ashkenazi rabbis. They have a s unique way to pass the Malachot. And part of it that once they disagree with the Shulchan Aruch, you won't find most rabbis who are holding in the writings of Rabbi Mashash and Rabbi Chaim Palaji and Rabbi Obadi Yosef, and especially not later Sephardic rabbis. The earlier ones, all Ashkenazi rabbis, you know, the Rambam, the, the Rif, the Ran. But the later ones, it's already not relevant to the way they pass the Malachot. The Tzit Eliezer made it his business that even the current Sephardic rabbis that were alive, he knew what they wrote. And so he writes here, it's a middle, this is Rabbi uh, Eliezer Waldenberg, this is his name. And he's saying, he says, the Marisham is nice, but, he says, I saw in the Benish Chai, not like a, and when that tells you that, that that's, that's a very special thing, that he's now a Baki, he knows the Sephardic books also. And that's why for us, he's such a valuable resource. Because he doesn't just say Halachot for Ashkenazim, but very often he'll say Halachot for Sephardim, and people find, you know, when Rabbi Bari Yosef was alive, he would say, so the Sephardim do this, and the Ashkenazim have to also do this. <laughs> and I'd say, with all due respect, you know, you're the Sephardic chief rabbi. It's, 
keep your, your nose out of the Ashkenazi halacha. But that's not the way halacha works. Halacha works that uh, there's no such thing as a Sephardic rabbi or an Ashkenazi rabbi. <coughs> if he's fluent on both approaches to halacha, he can give halacha for each side. And the Tzitzel Ezra would do the same thing sometimes. He would say, for Sephardim, they should also do like this. I mean, that was his, because he was an expert in his areas of halacha. So, he brings this thing here about uh, the fingernails that are sticking out, but it's worse than just cutting your nails in general. But that's according to Kabbalah. It's a, you need more netilat than I am for nails that go past that's the really flesh. Good. Yeah. So that's why we threw hold three times as opposed to once then? Yeah. If they're protruding. Do you, do you want to know the difference between nails that protrude or not? According to Kabbalah, does it interest you? Yeah. Yes. Yeah? Okay, so. That's interesting. <laughs> that's always interesting. Let me see where I am. Where's my set? Okay. Joseph, can I send you back there? <laughs> back to the same shelf, but I think it's one above. Is there a Shailot of a Chuvah? Is this a book called Rav Paulim on the left side? Yeah. Yeah? Okay, so I'm going to tell you which volume you need. Um, I need the second volume, Chelek Bet. Are there two beds or one bed? <laughs> this this is the gallery. Yeah? yeah? Can you ask my wife? She's in that room in the front. Ask her for the long charger. Yeah. She'll know what I'm talking about. Well, there's just, uh, just according to the center of the Shofan Aruch, it's like Orachayim. Look, I need Orachayim bed. There's just Orachayim, just one set. <laughs> okay, so bring it. Let's see what it is. Interesting. <coughs> Up here, see, what they did here is they put all the oh, Orachayims in one book. Okay. That's why it's good. Sometimes what old, older books, what some rabbis do is they write the page number they sign the book. But nobody's promising that the next editor of the book is going to keep the same page numbers. So we have a bib. The Ben Shchai has, this is his questions and answers to the Ben Shchai. A lot of things here according to Kabbalah that nobody else wants to deal with. Remember you? Who asked me once why we don't wash our feet before we pray? I did. You did? Yeah. Can I read this? Let's learn. Ben looks like Ben looks like a Muslim. We talk about yeah. Well, the Muslims got it from us. From us. The Gash was standing. Also, then I think what the son of the Rambam was trying to bring back something. Like yeah, that. it's about bowing. Bowing, yeah. <clears throat> Prostration. <clears throat> Oh, and there's an outlet over there. Wow, this is some pretty fascinating stuff. He's saying that essentially, even though the nails are the tamet part of your hand, the nails are the only part of your hand that make your hand pure. I Meaning, if you didn't have nails, your hand would always be impure. So even though they're the ones that bring impurity, they're also the ones that save you from having impurity. I don't ask me, I'm not in the Kuba. Well, but aren't, aren't the nails supposedly <clears throat> connected with the material that used to cover the body? Yes. From Adam of the says, if I'm to my, if a person says, Im ken lama ain't no sim tilal al why don't I wash my feet b'chol yom? K'mosh no sin ha'adayim. Like we wash our hands. The tam echadayim, they have the same reason to get rid of the klipot. Mine harav and mekubal, moreinu harav rabbi Shlomo Kohen. It was a Mikubal Kar Rabbi Shlomo Kohen. Besefer Yafesh Sha'a, in his book Yafesh Sha'a, Katav Tam Nachon Azeh. He writes a good reason. Vehu ki baranglaim nechazim mechitzonim yoter min ha'edan. That the forces of impurity hold on to the feet more than they hold on to the hands. They cling to them. Velechel et tokef achizatam elenu koach litchotam misham. 
And because they're so strong, we don't have the ability to remove them from our feet. Only the Kohanim, because of the merit of their service in the Ben Mikdash, they were able to push away those clipot from there. And that's why it says, And it says, that's why you understand now in the Shulchan Aruch, why it says that at least on Erev Shabbat you have to wash your feet. Why? Could be that the merit of Shabbat is strong enough, like the service of the Kohanim, to get rid of the clipot on the feet. Ad kan So is it halacha that we have to wash our feet before Shabbat? Yeah, you have to shower your whole body, especially your feet. <laughs> and look, he, he argues here, by the way, with Rabbi Chaim Palaji, who was one of the biggest Mekubalim. I just went to buy his set of books in New York, and I ran out of <laughs> Next time, it's not the same. <laughs> they just put out a new series of his books. Thank you. He says that this rabbi said that if your feet are clean, you don't have to do until the time once you touch them. It says he disagrees. He disagrees and that you have to wash your hands if your feet are clean. This seems to be according to Kabbalah, not according to Halakha. But if, if your feet are in shoes and if you touch your shoes, you have to. Then wash. those are okay. He would say even after the shower, you'd have to. Oh, okay. <clears throat> okay, now what were we looking for? About the nails going over, right? Yeah. Let's start another time. <coughs> Benish Chai. It's brilliant. But like, not just brilliant, it was a tzaddik. Like we've seen his writing. He knew everything. And he'd never, he was humble when he wrote. But he was holding in, in Halakha, in Tanakh, in Kabbalah, in, in the secrets. Everything he knew. And things, like, he, he doesn't tell you, oh, I don't know. I don't, it's not a part of Torah I'm not familiar with. It's everything he knew. Everything. It's not for it's not for not that many Sephardim have this connection with the Ben Chai, that they'll follow the Ben Chai through thick and thin. Mm -hmm. Even when we believe the Ben Chai to be uh, the Halakha is not like him in that situation. They still, because the Ben Chai is a big person to rely on. Right. Um, okay. Okay, so I'm going to read. I don't promise you that I understand anything that I'm reading. I'm going to read, I'm going to translate, and you're going to break your heads. <laughs> if it were not for the fingernails, I have to take your step back. This I really don't understand what I'm saying. <laughs> a person does not have any body part aside from his hands and toes his hands and feet I guess that have ten number ten what is ten? the ten sfirot the fish is sham who siyum kol hadinim according to Kabbalah this is the end of all judgment this is the endings of the body and this is why we wash our hands it's for this reason. There's no body part that has ten that can include all the sefirot except for your hands and feet, and that's why we wash them. Shem eser ve'eser. It's both ten and ten. V'yaduan. It's known the ena chizat the chitonim, the 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 chitonim, the outer forces, the impure forces. They don't cling They only cling to the endings of things, the endings of bodies. They're not holy enough to cling onto the, the real parts of a person, only to the endings of a person. 
ולכן בלילה באיזה שנה שרו רוח רע לידיים כי שם הוא הסיום. And that's why at night when a person sleeps they get רוח רע on their fingernails or toenails because that's the end of the body, it's not the actual part of the body. ויש להם לכל את החיצונים להתאחד שם and the חיצונים can cling to it ולכן צריך ליטול ידיו במים and that's why you have to wash your hands with water שהם בחינת החסד הכולל חמישה חסדים. Because water in Kabbalah is called chesed that has five kinds of chasadim. Mercy, kindness, and has five kinds of kindness. Validei ken memetkim chamesh gvurot menetzpach hakfulot that fixes the five gvurot that are multiplied by menetzpach asher bechamesh etzbaot yamin which are in the five right fingers בחמש אצבעות יד שמאל, the five left fingers, ואז הקליפות שהיו נאחדות באותם הגבוהות שברים אצבעות הכבודים, הם נדחים, מתפרשים, מסתלקים משם על ידי חמישה חסדים. He said, and right away the קליפות run away from this חסד that you pour on them, the water, כי לעולם החסד דוחה ומגרש של קליפה, that the rule is that חסד always pushes away קליפה. Always. But this is not just in practical קבלה, in theological קבלה. חסד, good, always pushes away the bad. Always. It's a rule. It's the way the world works. It's like the fa- Lubavitch Rebbe was famous for saying a little bit of light can dispel a lot of darkness. But it's true. If you have a dark room, you want to make a light, one ca- a match is good enough to give light to the room. Even the screen from your phone can give a light to the room. It's any light, any chesed always pushes away things that are bad. So now to what we were talking about, the fingernails. So now, If it wasn't for the nails that were put on the ends of, of the fingers, היו הידיים צמאות לעולם, your hands would always be impure. דהיינו אפילו ביום, even in the middle of the day, אפילו בלא שינה, even without sleeping, הייתה רוח רעה שורה להם, the רוח רעה would be on them. אך על ידי הציפורניים, but because there were nails, אשר הושמו על האצבעות, which were placed on the fingers, שהם לבוש קשה מאוד, לבוש על קדושה, their nails are very hard, and they're considered קדושה, they're considered holiness. לכן אין שורה רוח רעה להם בכל עת, אלא רק בלילה בית השנה. Therefore, Ruach Ra can only reach them at night while the person sleeps. Vigam bechol et she kanes the beta kiseh whenever he enters the bathroom. Nails, imagine, they, they get Ruach Ra at night, sleeping, and when he enters the bathroom. They're like magnets to, to clip on. Both hands and feet. Yeah. Vahad ha tzipornayim maginim haynu dafka otam shal abasar shal tzbaot. And those fingernails that protect your hands, kind of instead of your hands getting tame, your fingernails attract the tumah. They keep it away, they're deflectors, so to speak, for the Tumah. This is that which your fingernails deflect Tumah. Listen, this is it. Haina dafka otam shana basar shala etzbaot. Those are only the fingernail part that's on the actual finger. Acha chelek hao def ala tziponayim shekaneged basar etzba. But the, the, the nail that protrudes past the actual flesh. Adra batzal achto, you must cut it. That's a fertile place for klipot to hold on to and, and nurture. You must be careful to cut your nails that grow too long, he says. Whether in, on the hands or the feet. And like Rabbi Chaim Vital writes in the Shara Kavanot. So this is the difference. It seems to be that nails are good, technically. They, they take the Tumah, which keeps your body... Tahor, keeps it pure. But that's only if your nails are short. If your nails are long, they protrude from the flesh, then those nails actually attract bad kinds of klipot, and you want to get rid of them. So now I'm successfully saying that I said the entire paragraph of things I don't understand, but I wanted to see what the Venice guy had to say about it. So back to the Tzitz Eliezer. What's the Tzitz Eliezer? The Marsham says that if you hear Kaddish or Kedusha in the middle of cutting your nails, you're allowed to answer Amen. The Tzitz Eliezer wants to argue with him. So let me tell you what he's arguing with. It seems to be that he doesn't agree. 
Tzitzit Ezer says, that which, that which we allow a person, this is, seem, it's an interesting approach. It says, that which we allow a person to say amen while he's cutting his nails is because so long as he's still cutting his nails, he is not yet obligated in washing. washing. But once he finishes cutting his nails, yes. he has to wash his hands right away. And that point in time, he's no longer allowed to say amen. That's what the Tzitzit seems to say. Meaning, while you're cutting your nails, do you have to wash your hands? No. No. So you're allowed to say amen when you're a blessing. But once you finish cutting your nails, you have to. You, the chiyuv, the obligation of washing, already applies to you, and you therefore shouldn't say amen anymore, according to the Tzitzit Yezer. <coughs> so this would be an argument between the Tzitzit Yezer and the Maharsham, which Rabbi David Yusuf seems to be siding with. Again, probably because it's not biblical. So it makes sense to sign with the more lenient opinion. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Do we know about any tzaddikim who wash the feet? I don't know of anybody. Else. It seems to be about the what the British guy is telling you. It's not possible. It's not possible to get rid of those clipots so when you don't try. Even with the like nitilat yadaim, uh, nitilat, <laughs> alternate feet. Yeah. No, but, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what he's saying is only the Kohen had the ability to do this and the Ben Mignash. And it's a big deal. Well, you can't do it that if you sit down. I don't think that we know, by the way, Kohen, what Kohen looked like was, was uh, the fact that you have today Kohanim who are not observant, the Kohanim that don't take care of their Kedusha, it's a very sad thing. It, is. it means the Kohen doesn't realize where he's holding. It doesn't take away, by the way, the fact that we praise the Kohen doesn't mean that a Jew who's not a Kohen is not on a special level. A Jew is on a whole a world of a level. But I'm talking about a Kohen as it's an extra. It's, it's, uh, he is literally a walking, talking, clear a vessel for HaKadosh Baruch Hu's blessing. And if he doesn't treat himself with that level of Kedusha, so what, do you, what do you expect from him? I read that now there are a group of uh, Kohanim in Yerushalayim. They keep them from the childhood, uh, you know, in Kedusha, in the preserving them from probably from the Chlamik, Probably from the Temple Institute. Sounds like it sounds like like their project, okay. But a kohen is a kohen, like you should push. Is he a kohen? My grandmother, my father's mother was a kohen, bad kohen. My father's father was a levi. My father's mother was a bad kohen. There was two families built a synagogue together in Kiryatata, so half of the community were kohenim and half of the community were levim. What do you do on reading the Torah? Kohen, kohen levi. What do you do? I know someone uh, was talking about it in the Talmud, probably Ruben Green. So there was, I'll tell you what, what they did. They would find a Israel on the street. <laughs> they would adopt him, give him an Aliyah, number three. And then they have Kohen, Levi, number three. And then they would just keep going with Kohen, Levi, Levi. That's a, it's a community just of, and you had the same question in Jerba. Jerba was a place in Tunisia where almost everybody was Kohenim. There's communities just Kohenim. What do you do? Like, Brigad Kohenim? It's, a, it's an interesting question. These are things that that you have to... And what was amazing about the synagogue, it was everybody was related to each other. So when my grandfather would get an aliyah, he was most everyone's in the room older relative. So everybody stood up for him because he was their either their uncle or their father or their grandfather or their ste- you know older brother-in-law or whoever it was. And you had like, you know, so then this one would stand up and only half the community would stand. And this one, you could tell how old they were, which rank they had. It was an interesting, <laughs> interesting kind of thing. Uh, these generate, they don't exist anymore, this kind of place. But, should you find a coin? Push the coins. My grandma would always say, you can't use a coin. It's true, you're not supposed to use a coin. I remember one person, and I, once in my life I saw that I was careful not to use coin, like, get me this or do that for me. The only person in my life I ever saw do this. Rabbi Hollander. Rabbi Hollander, when I was we in yeshiva th- in, in Hebrew day school, so one of the kids in the class was a Kohen, and Rabbi Hollander would never ask him to do something. And he was right. There's a mitzvah v'kidash to make a Kohen home. And that's a proper halakha to follow. Not a Not a levim. We were just the schleppers. The no, that was a levim. We made the Kohen. You know, the Kohen come from us, not the other way around. <laughs> But they were promoted. What would they do without you? <laughs> you know what they say. They say that God... I had a guest in Shabbat who wasn't Jewish. He was Christian. Very Christian. 
So what I told them was, uh, I said, you know what we say? She was talking about the Mormons. We don't like them. They're crazy. They're this. I told them, you know, there's a famous saying that says that God created the Mormons so the Christians know how the Jews feel. It's <laughs> 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 so the same thing. Perhaps the Hashem created the Kohanim so the Levim know how the Israelim feel. Right? You know, like, oh yeah, you guys came out of us and you figure something, so Hashem made Kohanim. <laughs> Oh, and they have some real restrictions. So sure. Marriage can be a real problem. Marriage can be a problem. Going certain places, yeah. traveling certain places. Fine. And what time is that? We have a few more minutes. Nun Gimel, haircuts. I remember when I was in Yeshiva, there was a guy who would, he had a little barber shop in the, in the Yeshiva. Amazing. It was a real barber, like a licensed barber. I had a little store there. And he had a sink there. And the sink was... Uh, that was it. He had a few interesting things. He had something I'd never seen in my life. Basically, you sit there, he finishes a haircut, and he puts something over your head, and it sucks all the hair off. I'd never seen him that. <laughs> it was incredible. I was like, you know, you never come out of there. I was like, okay. And then they had a sink over there. And then the sink, it said, he would never let you leave until you didn't get out today. That was part of the, hmm. the policy. It's true. You haven't got today right away when you wash it. So let's hear. If a person gives himself a haircut, he must wash his hands once after this. This is an assumption that you wash once. Rabbi David said the same. The Benish Chai says that by nails you wash once. So he's saying hair is not as bad as nails, so you would wash once also. Like you asked, even if he's only cutting a little bit of hair, not his whole head, he's trimming something, he's, he's fixing something. He has to wash his head afterwards. And even if he gets a haircut from somebody else, he has to wash his hands. And he who's giving the haircut, he has to wash his hands. Because he's touching the head of his friend. Not because he cut the hair. Because Rabbi David Yosef is going in line with what he says, that you analyze the shulchan, it was only he who was getting the haircut washes his hands. Not the one who's giving the haircut. But he says, because inevitably the one who's giving the haircut is touching the hair, the head. The head which is uh, dirty. I thought you said touching the hair, you know. It's different than touching with other parts of the body. He specifically not, says here the head. Head, but is that the hair covered part or just any part? This part. It seems to be that it's sweaty. It's covered, if not by a kippah, then by hair most of the mm -hmm. time. And if it's considered a, a covered part of your body, which a person have to do that to die for. Okay. <clears throat> Who asked about gloves, by the way? One of you said gloves. No, we were joking about something. Oh, yeah. I don't Somebody know. Somebody with gloves. Right. Interesting question. It could be that a person will wear... No. Someone wears a sleeping glove. Could be. It could be like that. That's what I was thinking. But he said somebody who sleeps with the gloves, it doesn't have to do that the night in the morning. They mm don't? -hmm. No. Then that's what we give for soldiers. Soldiers who don't have water in the morning, we tell them to sleep with gloves. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well... Anyone, okay. So anyone that sleeps with gloves doesn't have to do with the old washing out your diet? Yeah, have to do it's it. a way to get at it. It's oh. still better to do that today, according to some opinions, but it works, according to other opinions, not to do that today. Oh. Talk to me about shoes. Cloth shoes, leather shoes, as well. Touch your shoes. Take on and off your shoes. Do you have to wash your hands? I think you're supposed yeah. to. Yeah. Just touching your shoes, I think. Okay. He removes his shoes. He has to wash his hands afterwards. Because he's actually touching his shoes. But not socks. Let's see. Let's see. Because in the old days, did they wear socks? 
Yeah, in some places. Depends on where you work. In Europe, socks were much in more Russia, prevalent than in Australia. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> some people had socks made out of leather. They were leather socks. They were kind of shoes in their own right. Couldn't be comfortable. I don't know. <laughs> couldn't, couldn't have been less than aromatic. <laughs> <laughs> After one, especially if you couldn't wash it. <laughs> because he touches his shoes. When a chol achmir, and it's proper to be strict, she told you to have to wash his hands three times. After touching shoes. If you touch with, if you touch clean, uh, new shoes, new shoes, in the new store, shoes. new shoes. I mean, like you see, not even ever worn on the feet, maybe like oh, they're on the yeah, shelf. Yeah, that's what we're saying. We're saying you touch new shoes that were never worn before. And you still have to wash. But we're going to see now. If you touch shoes that are new, Shalol of Shan Adain, top of 97, you still haven't, a person that's never worn. And not Sarich, you don't have Klan, you don't have to wash your hands at all. Mm -hmm. you, you know, shoes that are on the shelf, you go to a shoe store that no one's worn yet, at least as far as you. Of course, they might have tried it on. So. Right, but that one, it seems to me that doesn't count for dirty yet. <coughs> if you take off your shoes without touching them with your hands, some people have shoes that laces, they just slip them off. You don't have to wash your hands. It's, it's a logical thing. You touch your, your shoes or you don't touch your shoes. If you touch shoes, but they're not on your feet, he has to wash his hands. This raises another question. There's always another question. But if a person's a professional barber or aesthetician who cuts nails, and you have non-Jews as well as Jews. Now, the state of Tuma Tahar is different for a non-Jew than a Jew. Interesting question. You know, whether you'd have to wash after a non-Jew. I have, I, I, have I, Jewish, I have a Jewish barber. Yeah? It's an interesting question. Probably a good idea. <laughs> yeah, no, it's probably a good idea. To have I just barber, but, uh, <clears throat> but if you're, let's say you're professional. You're the barber. barber. That's what I'm saying. You're yeah. the barber. Oh, yeah. And you have clients that are Jewish, not Jewish, like everybody. Mm -hmm. I was in New York. I saw a store. I wish I would have taken a picture. It's a barber shop for men and boys, and it has a huge sign specializing in upshirts. That's what it said. I don't know. Such a, it's like, this guy, he does upturns. Professional upturn maker. <laughs> it's true. That's a mistake. But it's the halakha, you should know. I used to be nikhshah on this. I grew up in San Diego. Certain standards are set that are not good. But getting a haircut, a man can only get a haircut from a man. You know this halakha. Cannot get a haircut from a lady. A lady cannot get a haircut from a man. It's not like a doctor who's, who's this is his trade and some rabbis were leaning there. By getting haircuts, a man by a man and a woman by a woman. <laughs> Something to to fix. Take cool. So where can we find a man? By a barber shop. Most barber shops have. Used to be you always look for the pole, the spinning pole. Gaze. You know, so what about gaze? Also, oh, that's a man. What's the problem? Vakosher hasochim, hakosher hasochim, shara dalai. It's a man. It's a person side. like everybody else. Right? How do you know? You don't know. Say so you don't know, but he, yeah. you know. <laughs> he's pretending. Vakosher hasochim shal analeim. He who ties, he who ties laces on the shoes. Bloshe gab analeim. You're not tying an actual shoe. You're not touching the shoe. You're tying the laces. Laces. You don't have to wash your hands because the laces are not like shoes, and therefore you don't have to do it after you touch the laces. What's the difference? I think one was touching the shoe there, and this one's touching the laces. Yeah, but what's the difference? I mean, both, if it's because of cleanliness, are your laces any cleaner than the shoe? Hmm. And it, and it's usually different material. Cotton. Yeah, the time of my last shoes was mostly uh, leather shoes. Mm -hmm. Okay, he says at the end of this rabbi, Yafen Alev, had a, a proof from a certain Gemara that laces are not the same thing as shoes. But he says, even though his proof is not so uh, uh, concrete, 
But it makes sense that it's already something you don't have to be so strict about. So by laces were lenient because already there was an opening. And it seems the Chazanish was also leading the bed. That seems Rabbi Vadi Yosef was leading the bed as well as the Rivavot Ephraim, Rabbi Ephraim Greenblatt. I told you about him. Rabbi Ephraim Greenblatt was a big tzaddik, a big posek, one of the greatest poskim who lived in the last generation. He was the chief rabbi of Memphis, Tennessee. He started the community there. He was the main student of Rabbi Moshe Feinstein. He, at the end of his life, he lived in Israel. Listen to the story. When I met my wife, she thought oh, there was this old man who passed away. She used to... He was still alive then, actually. <coughs> so she used to walk him to Mincha every day mm-hmm. and learn with him sometimes. And his name was Rabbi Greenblatt. So, nice guy, old guy, always told... I said, which Rabbi Grimblatt? Rabbi Ephraim Grimblatt. I said, you walk Rabbi Ephraim Grimblatt to Milcha. You know, that's like walking Rabbi Moshe Feinstein to Milcha. <laughs> and this was a, in the, one of the biggest poskim. Ovadi Yosef quotes him all over the place. <laughs> Rabbi Moshe Feinstein all over the place. She had no idea. And that was what was amazing about him. Remember, but he didn't walk around with his air. Of, like, I'm the. Unfortunately, he lost his wife in a car accident in Memphis. And he was old. He was alone. He moved back to Israel to his family. He didn't have enough money to bring his books with him. A hundred, they say, a hundred thousand dollars worth of books. He left wow. behind in Memphis. Left behind in Memphis. Nobody would help him bring his books to Israel. Whoa. <clears throat> he said he would always sit in Jerusalem and he would cry about two things: about his wife and about his books. But uh, what happened? I don't know. I was just now at his daughter's house in Israel when I was there, so we went to go visit his daughter. I was a good friends with my wife. She's an older lady, but she's a uh, very special to me. So he also says that uh, shoelaces are not the same thing as shoes. Just like fingernails are not the same as fingers? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Or protruding nails, not the same. It's a long nails. It's a different, it's a different thing. No, shoelaces is, is part of the body. Well, the shoelaces don't protrude, you have a hard time talking. <laughs> We're going to hold the shoe right here. Let's stop the camera if I can.